This is the chapter one of the book and it is called Why Do We Learn Statistics? And the first part of the book is about the psychology basis of the statistics. So the basic idea of this part is that we need statistics because we don't trust ourselves enough. So especially because we are hum humans, so we are susceptible to all kinds of biases and temptations. So using only our common sense to interpret um, the world or more specifically the data, um, is not the like the most appropriate way to to do that as yeah we are biased for our beliefs so statistics is a safeguard of our biases or our personal biases so the instincts of our god are designed to solve scientific problems the author argue that um yeah, our brains are more made for solve like daily life problems, like like very easily uh, common problems rather than complex, large scale problems. And yeah, nowadays we have like a lot of um, massive complex problems, and it is partially derived of the fact that cultural evolution is expected to be faster than biological evolution. Also, this is uh, controversial, but it's something that the author proposed. So definitely we need a tool or help for interpreting data and putting aside this kind of biases. So in this, in the next uh, part of the chapter, the author is saying that the people are smart, but yeah, we really find hard to be neutral. And we evaluate the evidence and the data impartially, especially because we are very uh, skewed by our pre-existing beliefs. So in here, yeah, they are giving some examples about how we are conclusions when we are provided with arguments. The first example is, yeah, is when we have valid arguments and the conclusion sounds like true. In, for example, the premise one is that no cigarettes are inexpensive. The premise two is that some addictive things are inexpensive. So the conclusions, is that some addictive things are not cigarettes. So the conclusion sounds like true. Um, people tend to say that then this is valid, like a valid um, reasoning. So the second example is when we have valid arguments, but the conclusion doesn't, like, doesn't sound like true. For example, no addictive things are inexpensive, is the premise one. The premise two is that some cigarettes are inexpensive. And the conclusion is that some cigarettes are not addictive. So yeah, the conclusion doesn't sound like true um, because, of, because of that. Uh, people, or most of the people will tend to say that is an invalid uh, argument. The third example is what we have an argument partially invalid, but the conclusion sounds like true. For example, the premise one is that no addictive things are inexpensive. The premise two is that some cigarettes are inexpensive. And then the conclusion is that some addictive things are not cigarettes. So the conclusion sounds like true. And then uh, despite the premises are just partially valid, we or people tend to say that it is valid. And the final example is that when we, we have an invalid argument, but and the conclusion sounds like false. For example, the premise one is that not cigarettes are inexpensive. The premise two is that some addictive things are inexpensive. And then the conclusion is that 
some cigarettes are not addictive. This is like more easy because the conclusion sounds like false. We, yeah, people tend to say that it's an invalid argument. So this, uh, for example, is just ex uh, uh, showing how we make conclusions for um, completely true or completely false or partially true arguments. So, and how our uh, beliefs or what we think it's true or false uh, in, is involved in how we make a conclusion. So, he, uh, here, the author is giving us an, a scenario that assumes that people are really perfect, able to set aside their pre existing biases about what is true and what is not, and purely evaluate an argument based on its logical merits. Yeah, for this like a scenario where people like is completely really ne neutral, we will expect this outcome. When people is given with an argument that it is completely valid and the conclusion feels like true, we will expect that the 100% of the people will say that it is a valid argument. And um, yeah, when people is given with an argument invalid, but the conclusion feels like true, we will expect that no one uh, say that it is valid because it's a completely invalid argument. And we, we yeah, just, we give a valid argument, but, but the conclusion feels like false we will expect that all the people is going to say that it is valid despite the conclusion feels, feels like false because the argument is completely valid. And yeah, and when the argument is valid but the conclusion feels like false, we will expect no one is going to say it is valid. But yeah, this is the ideal scenario of uh, non-biased people or completely neutral people. However, previously, uh, yeah, this experiment has been run, yeah, in in the real world, and yeah, this is the citation of the, uh, the this experiment. What and what the researchers found it is that when pre-existing biases were in agreement with the structure of the data, uh, people is going to say. So we are going to obtain the results. Let me explain better. Uh, when people is given or with an argument that it is completely valid and the conclusion feels like true, 90% of the people said it was valid, which is completely sensible. When people was given with an invalid argument and the conclusion feels like false, only 8% said is valid. Well, so far we have like a uh, kind of reasonable, reasonable um, results. However, uh, in the next part, um, looks what happens when our intuitive feelings about the truth make uh, in the conclusions, when it runs against the logical structure of the argument. This is when people is provided with an invalid arguments, but the conclusion feels like true, 92% of the people said it was valid. And when people was provided with a completely valid argument, but the conclusion sounds like false, 46% said it was valid. So this is like crazy. <laughs> Because means, what, are here, what does it mean? When people are presented with a strong argument that contradicts our pre-existing beliefs, we find it pretty hard to perceive, perceive it as a strong argument. And that happened 46% of the time. But what it is even worse is that when people was presented with a very weak argument that agrees with our pre-existing biases of, or beliefs, Almost no one can see that the argument argument was completely weak. So, 
Yeah, basically what it is uh, showing or the point that the author is try trying to make is that, yeah, we cannot believe in our common sense or our personal interpretation of the data. So we really need a, a tool that uh, for reduce our personal biases. And yeah, in gen very general terms, statistics can be seen as a tool to increase our chances for making the right decisions. So the next part of the chapter is talking about, is called the cautionary tale of Simpson paradox. The Simpson paradox is some statistical phenomenon where an association between two variables in population emerge, disappear or reverses when the population is divided by populations. So it is, yeah, let, let me, yeah, here is uh, the example. This is the example the author is providing in the book. Uh, in the 70s, the University of California, Berkeley was object or some suit because, yeah, people was, uh, yeah, seeing the statistics, they, the people saw that of the total of men applicants, 44 percent of them were uh, accepted in the university. But in the case of the women, only 35 percent got accepted. So yeah, they start to like um, this serial of sweats because they say like they had like this gender bias towards men. And yeah, when the researchers to respond to, to uh, that thing, they se se uh, separate the data in subgroups, which is by departments in the school. Each one of these groups means a different department. And they, let me, they observe that indeed, the women are having more success in the applications rather than male. How can um, be this? And it is because there are, I mean, there are some de departments where that accept more people than others. This is, for example, the STEM or the sciences departments have more uh, funding. So they tend to accept uh, a larger amount of people rather than the humanities or arts departments that have like that have their uh, money. So for example, here, yeah, the points means like 10, yeah, and, and women tend to apply more to the departments that have their number of, pos of positions rather than men that tend to apply more to sciences. So in this chart, in this graph, the points means like 10 applicants. For example, we here, we have a department that accept like more people. And we can see uh, indeed women got accepted 82% uh, of the times, while the men only got like 62% of the times. So, and um, yeah, this is like almost consistent for every one of the departments. So it is like, it is, yeah, these like general results in the, in the averages are an artifact of how like the data are structured. So if we combine this data, we can observe like these, these, these um, average results, but yeah, it's just an artifact of how the data are structured. So, yeah, so yeah, here, here it says that, uh, yeah, where they conclude in, in the final doc document, they conclude that women are affected more by the social schemes and the educations that make that um, they tend more to apply for fields that doesn't involve like hard sciences. 
um, but not by the university. So, and yeah, what the book is trying to show with, how come I did? Sorry. What the book is trying to say in here, what is, yeah. Nope, it's open, possibly, sorry. Yeah, what the book is trying to say, it, has, it is that our, again, that our like um, general feeling or interpret general interpretation of the averages or the general patterns of the data can lie us. So we really need more reliable tools to interpret data and consider as well the structure of the data. Um, yeah, the last part of the book is specifically why we need statistics in psychology. Um, yeah, it's basically because psychology is a um, statistical science. Um, yeah, at it's uh, the author says that at fundamental level, psychology is harder than physics. This is because the humans are complex entities and to understand like their behavior or their um, social patterns, you need to involve a lot of like random and com complex variables. And for example, uh, in, in the opposite case, the phys physicist only, for example, study, let, let's say, for example, the atoms that doesn't involve people like trying to sabotaging an uh, experiment, for example. So he said that at the very end, psychology could be harder even than physics. And I think it could happen with other like, and sciences that involve social or biological entities. But yeah, um, it's raised the question, can someone else do my statistics in psychology? And the answer says like, no, because um, statistics is deeply involved in the research design. So you uh, or psychologists really need to know statistics to perform good and strong research designs. And even for the basic understanding of the scientific literature, they need to understand basic statistics. And yeah, the final reason is that statistics nowadays is really, really expensive. And indeed is like a priority skill in some countries. For example, they put the example of Australia where there is like a top priority uh, higher stati statisticians because they, there is some scarcity. So they will get very well paid in, in, in Australia. So yeah, basically for a normal um, like a student of psychology or some researcher that is just starting their career it could be really expensive to pay someone for doing their statistics. So, and yeah, the, uh, another final reason is that we live in the 21st century and data are everywhere. And yeah, what else? Ah, yeah. And also another reason to learn statistics is that they are in basically everywhere. And here he comments um, a personal experience. They, they also like comment a personal experience where uh, yeah, it. He, I think it's a woman. Uh, she took like 20 of the most recent articles posted in a website. And of those, he separate eight that were involved with statistics topics and analyze them or review them. Review them. Uh, they saw that six of them made mistakes. So at the very everyday life, basic statistics, knowledge about basic statistics is helpful for trying to figure out when someone else is either making a mistake or even lying to you. So 
for everything you need to learn statistics. And yeah, this is the chapter one. That's all. Do you have questions or comments? Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. I just a um, uh, quick question. Why uh, about you? Uh, why, why did you choose uh, um, statistics? Um, basically, because, yeah, it's a very basic tool I, it, that I really need to analyze my PhD data. And I have the feeling that I have like lost a lot of lot of the information I got during the degree <laughs> during my career. So I really want to have like again a fresh um, uh, refresh the knowledge. And also, for example, in my case, I just learned statistics like by hand, like making calculation with that tiny, small uh, data frame or data set. However, now for my PhD, I am like dealing with this, this like really large amount of data and also not always the like the most traditional approaches or the examples we saw in the degree are the most appropriate. And definitely uh, now I need to analyze them with a software because yeah doing that by hand is definitely not uh, something that can be done so yeah that is why i am again <laughs> re learning statistics but now with with r yeah thank you it's uh, it's about the same the same for me basically so i did a lot of uh, you know mathematical uh, calculations and proofs and everything, but um, so when I approach the, um, the 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 art software uh, and uh, um, being able to apply those those back knowledges uh, into uh, practical knowledge uh, that make everything uh, clearer. So all the things had uh, like more sense. Uh, so now uh, I still have some difficulties sometimes, uh, uh, like when I have a formula uh, and then go straight away into R to, to, to apply the formula and make the calculation. So I, I still have, uh, you know, require a bit of time to understand what I should do to obtain something like this, you know. Uh, and it's 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 nice because we have lots of functions which are already uh, made. So you just apply the function and you just done all those things that <laughs> they were in theory very complicated. But uh, so so that that's a relief somehow, uh, and you can manage a uh, large uh, quantity of data. Uh, one other question I'd like to ask is, uh, what, what do you like about statistics most? Mm -hmm. I had no thought on that. <laughs> possibly, possibly the fact that we can like separate the real um like the the real trends or the real patterns of the data separate them from from the noise i mean <laughs> this uh, as the book says like usually yeah we are like um 
skewed by how or at, at what degree we can interpret the data with our common sense or only what were with our like uh, our knowledge however when we use statistics we could like uh, as i said separate for example uh, the noise from the real uh, patterns of the data or from or we could understand what it is really explaining our data. And I, I think that is really, really a nice thing. As definitely the, the chapter is something that is like saying that we can observe, observe and uh, obtain and see things that we could not see without the glasses of the statistics. Yeah, it's it's something that is. I think it's I think it's like really really um, cool things or tool to use. Yeah, what 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 about you? Do you have like something especially that you really like about the statistics? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, yeah, obviously. Uh, okay, I lo I love math uh, and numbers, so everything that is deals with numbers, it's uh, um, something I'm interested in. Uh, but as, as you said, statistics like uh, releases, uh, gives out a summary of, your, of the data. So you can just um, um, summarize the most important information and then uh, um, say, uh, explain a phenomenon uh, through a uh, few numbers, uh, and uh, this is very, uh, very exciting. But uh, something that back back to my back to my school time, um, something that interested me about statistics was that it, it is everywhere. It is uh, it can be applied to um, uh, all topics basically. So you, uh, it, it, it's, it's very uh, useful um, um, set of tools that you can use to, uh, it, 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 they can be, it, be applied to everything, basically. To politics, to economics, to, uh, you know, health. Uh, every, everything can be explained through statistics. And so uh, it is fas fascinating uh, because even through looking at the news, um, when, when you look at the news uh, on TV or you read the newspaper, you find the, the summaries of uh, uh, something that happened and it did pass through statistics. So that, that, that's what uh, grabbed, my, grabbed my attention in the early times <laughs> when I was at school. Yeah, and I think combined statistics combined with coding or with programming is a really, really like powerful tool. As so yeah, I I have seen how like few data can be a little bit um, influenced by the variance of the individual data, but using this large amount of data could like be really, really a powerful tool to uh, see how really a phenomena is behaving and what are the things that are driving that, that, that thing. I, I think combine these two things like statistics and with coding could be really a powerful tool for, yeah, for understanding, as you say, things in in a lot of uh, fields you know, in the, from like basic things like the news or economics phenomena or uh, social phenomena until more complex like climatic or yeah similar things or physical things yeah I, I, I really combined could be really a powerful tool.
Yeah, I think I agree with uh, all the points you've mentioned. Padrika, I think nicely said that, you know, statistics gives you that power or tool basically that lets you, you know, play around with data, summarize it and then look at it from different um, aspects and make sure that you're able to get, you know, even though you have big data, but you can scope it down in, in terms of averages of maybe category, subcategory and, you know, overall and whatnot. So it, it helps you understand and digest the the kind of data that you're looking at from granular point of view and you don't have to actually look at you know all all the row level data and it gives you that sense um and uh, i guess i just wanted to sort of uh, uh, put ryan on spot because we have ryan this time joining us hey ryan so since you were presenting earlier so i didn't want to interrupt and all the good times we can we can have him uh, maybe introduce himself. Oh sure, hey everyone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Ryan. I uh, have been interested. I started this book on my own um, maybe a year ago and couldn't make it through. So um, just happy to be able to join. Um, I recognize a couple of familiar names, Priyanka and mm -hmm. Federico. We've been on some book clubs before, so it's nice to uh, nice to meet you, Esmeralda and. I'm looking forward to continuing. Yeah, great to see, uh, have you back, Ryan. Um, I think you've been pretty busy off late. Yes. But, uh, I'm glad to see you here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I took a, a hiatus for a little while, um, but yeah. glad to be able to be back. Yeah, no, and I think that was a well-deserved one. I remember I, I actually pointed out one of one of the book clubs where you're like, We've been doing so much. So from the time you picked up R to maybe for a year or two, you were like so rigorously working on it. So yeah, I think that was a well-needed one. Yes, indeed. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So um, I think let's let's sort of um, wrap it up saying, so thank you, Esmeralda, for uh, taking us through chapter one. Uh, we met for the first time with, with this group um, last week where I covered chapter three actually started with the introduction of, um, you know, introduction section of R. Um, so if anyone wants to go through that, um, and we, so we decided we will come back and start with, you know, the chapter one officially to this, this session. And then next uh, week we will go through and talk about uh, the research design process. So which is chapter two. Um, I think we still have uh, the volunteer space open if anyone wants to present that. Um, so I think Esmeralda was interested, but if anyone else is 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 interested to, you know, feel free to look at the um, vo volunteer uh, Google Sheet in, in the channel. It's pinned in the channel. And um, uh, yeah, so I guess we will continue going through each chapter each week, like, you know, we always do in other book clubs. And um, for any any follow up questions, any resources that you additionally uh, find, you know, we can continue the chat on the uh, Slack channel for for this book. And um, and if there's no other question, I think we can just call it a day, and we'll we'll see you all next week. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Esmeralda. Thank you, Thank everyone, you. for joining. Bye. 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 Bye.